This is a conversation between myself and filmmaker Antonio Hernandez. Antonio and I have something in common. We're both men who made documentaries about women's wrestling. Antonio just released the documentary about African-American rising wrestling star Trisha Dora. And I made a documentary called Lady Wrestler, The Amazing Untold Story of African-American Women in the Ring which traces the history of black women in pro wrestling back to the 1950s and includes interviews with legends like Ramona Isbell and Ethel Johnson. I hope you enjoy this interview and let me know what you think. So like, why don't we just kind of actually like talk about like, um, you know, how you got into filmmaking and a little bit about yourself. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'm pretty much self-taught. Um, I didn't go to school for filmmaking or anything. Um, okay. Actually, I got a degree in um, international studies and anthropology. Okay. Um, I ended up taking this class called visual anthropology. Where'd you and, go to school, by the way? In uh, Towson University in Baltimore. Okay. Baltimore County. And um, ended up taking this class a little bit after I got into photography a little bit. Okay. Um, I just did a project um, with my classmate and I kind of just got from there. Um, I didn't really have like dreams of being a filmmaker. I didn't know anyone that was like doing film or anyone doing entertainment. Um, like no one in my family is really like an artist. Okay. Or, like creative entrepreneur or anything. Um, so I ended up getting a job at Voice of America. Are you familiar with Voice of America? Uh, it sounds familiar, but can you uh, fill yeah. me in on it? So it's the uh, federal government's like international news agency. Okay. Um, so I was just a media logger for a couple years, um, just transcribing stuff, um, listening okay. to speeches. Um, then I started my own web series, uh, like 2016, 2017, um, kind of just doing like local arts and stuff. I was doing a blog, uh, and that's where the name Electric Llama came from. So that was the name of my blog. What was, um, what was the web series about? Um, like local arts, um, originally it was going to be a zine, um, but I didn't really know much about print. So I just did like kind of like just highlighting different artists. Okay. Um, one ended up being about pro wrestling. It was, um, there was a promotion called Nova Pro Wrestling. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. They were based out of Northern Virginia. Um, so they ended up folding maybe like last year or 2018 or something like that. But I did a story um, and then that doing that series led me to a job working for um, the DC government. So their office of cable television, um, I started doing contract work for them. And then, um, so I've been there for a couple of years and I've been like doing stories and um, shooting, producing, editing, um, getting into doing like motion graphics and stuff. And then I started the series Indelible in um, October of 2018. Um, and it was similar to what I was doing before, but it's a lot more focused. So I decided to kind of just focus on um, black and, uh, sorry, uh, women and LGBT artists. Okay. Um, in DC and Baltimore. Um, Maybe and you're from the DC Baltimore area? Or you right, yeah, I'm from DC. So I'm in uh, PG County nearby. Okay. And, um, so I always found myself um, kind of just going back um, to back in between DC and Baltimore, going to shows. Uh, I DJ as well. So, you know, I would just find out a lot of artists through the internet or I would see them at shows or I would see lineups that either artists I knew or friends of mine that are performing. Um, so then I just started Indelible. And uh, initially it was a web series. Um, and then what I started doing, of course, before the pandemic and everything, was I would do screenings of everything that I have. Um, so what I would do is put everything, so I would have the web series and I would also have like material that didn't make it to the actual episode. Okay. So I would put all that together and I would do a screening of it. Um, so I did four of those last year. Um, every time I did a screening, every time I cut the film together, I, um, it was different. So I recut it every time. So every time you came, so I took stuff, stuff out, I extended some scenes, I added new stuff because I was continu continually shooting throughout the year. Okay. Um, so I did four of those screenings last year. Um, and then I think I have eight episodes out now. And then I met Trish because the day of the show that she had on February 15th, I ended up seeing the flyer for the show at a coffee shop. 
that morning. Um, and it was for uh, this promotion in DC called Fight Club. And there was like this kind of sub, I guess sub promotion in a way called um, the Pan-African World Diaspora Wrestling Championship. Okay. So that's the title she won. And that's the title she's being like, she's a champion. And she kind of talked a lot about that in the film. So I ended up seeing, going to that show and just bringing my camera and just taking a lot of uh, stills. And then um, I was like, I was just blown away. And then um, I kind of just went up to her real quick and just said, hey, um, I want to kind of do a piece on you and we should talk um, when you get some time. It was like after the show and it was kicking everybody out the building. And we ended up um, having coffee, I think, maybe like a week after. And then that next week um, we did an interview. Um, and then two days after that was her match in D.C., her first defense of her title. Okay. And then, which was March uh, 7th, and then pretty much after that, I think that was her last match in D.C. before everything kind of happened with the shutdowns and everything. Okay. And then, um, yeah, we did the live premiere last night. Um, I think it's got a really good response so far. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but I definitely will. But so tell, like, for somebody who, you know, is not, is not familiar with Indelible, you know, and is interested in checking it out, what is it about and this episode in particular what's the um you know what's the premise and how did you come up with the idea yeah so yeah indelible is um it's uh, just a like a hybrid series uh documentary project um just kind of highlighting um artists in dc baltimore and beyond um okay. focusing on uh, women lgbt artists and kind of highlighting kind of the subcultures and communities that they're in and they're around. Okay. Uh, if you start the series from beginning to end, um, you'll see different artists in other episodes. So you, you may see, um, for example, there's an, uh, there's a band um, from here in Maryland in college park called black folks don't swim. Oh, wow. And, and which is a great name. It's my yeah, favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what's cool about them is that several members of that band are in another band of a, like a, uh, like a jazz funk artist named Jenna Camille. Okay. Who, uh, so, but then, then also one of the members that had recently joined black folks don't swim, um, all, actually created a, uh, what do you call it? a collective of, trans and non-binary artists okay so um and there's lots of kind of situations like that where you're seeing people collaborating playing each other's bands um you see artists kind of just maybe even in the crowd of some other shows can you kind of kind of see how they kind of interact and they support each other uh, with the trish episode this was actually meant to be a feature okay uh, something maybe around 45 minutes to an hour um so that was the plan Sorry, bug flu. There was a, the plan was to kind of follow her throughout the summer. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be, it's kind of going to be like a special edition and it's kind of not in the same universe in a way of um, everything else. Um, but I just kind of just wanted to do it some into wrestling. And um, so what I ended up doing was just like, well, I had the interview and I have um, that match footage and I contacted the companies that I found matches for it from. And, um, I decided to put that together in the short because we did the interview for a little over an hour and she, we pretty much just covered almost all the bases of like how she got into wrestling, mm -hmm. uh, you know, training in Florida, coming back to DC, a uh, couple of the uh, promotions she's wrestled for, um, how I was wrestling for primetime pro wrestling here in DC. Um, so I kind of decided just to do something now. Right. And then hopefully when this is all over, can it kind of pick it up and do like a follow up? Right. So do you kind of uh, plan to do like a brand new interview or just kind of take the existing footage and um, or just maybe do both, like take the existing footage and do a new interview to kind of expand Trisha's story? I think I'm going to do just new stuff. Uh, pretty much I used maybe 80 percent of like the topics from the interview and then okay uh the piece is 20 minutes and i think it was like maybe 12 or 15 minutes of her so i mean i think i literally used maybe like 20 percent of the actual interview uh yeah so yeah we used like pretty much most of everything um like i said i put out uh, 
uh, like a two minute video, like an extra of her talking about wrestling men. Mm -hmm. Um, And that I didn't want to put in the film just because I kind of like just um, not having to speak on it. It kind of just it kind of just was a thing that she does. And um, I just made it very kind of like just normal, like she pretty much just wrestle men. That's what she does. Um, the only other thing I left out um, was her talking about her influences. She talked about jazz and Jacqueline. Um, and I just didn't have a lot of material on them, so I didn't really want to use that. Okay. But yeah, we, I definitely want to get – I had plans to actually um, go and get footage of her training at Ring of Honor. So she trains with Ring of Honor here – or she was training with Ring of Honor here in Maryland. Uh, so I didn't actually get footage of her training um, in the ring, but on the day of her match, I was able to get her um, going over her spots and everything. So was there anything she said that really surprised you during the interview? Um, well, well, there's a couple things. One was that uh, she she actually used to work with um, one of the artists that I covered the first episode, so of Indelible. So there's a rapper named Autumn Mojo. She's here from Maryland. Um, so they actually used to work at the same place. So they kind of, they knew each other, which is okay. just like a funny coincidence. Uh, another thing, um, which is her going to Florida and talking about how she went to go train at the Delhi Boys School. Okay. Uh, and she kind of went there... Um, she ended she really she was basically like homeless in a way or just without housing from when she first got there because she kind of left and then was florida she was said that she didn't have any place to stay for the first like little bit um and then she was just saying how she came back and it was just by chance she found like a tryout for ring of honor um and she used kind of like a lot of the money that she had and she kind of just was in a fork of the road and she was saying she either will continue wrestling when she's back because she didn't really enjoy Florida and she decided and to just kind of go for it again. Um, so I think, uh, so that's probably one of the things that I probably will address the next time. Cause she talked about um, in greater detail about kind of the two forks in the road. One was going to Florida with not much. Um, she had some money saved and then coming back and trying to use, again, using her money saved to um, pursue wrestling again. Uh, but I think now it'll be interesting to see, like, you know, since she's not, like, none of the wrestlers besides the the two big companies or the three big companies, I guess, can are training and putting on shows. So a lot of, like, the local independent wrestlers, they've not been training. Um, they might be doing home workouts or something, but they're not training. They're not having matches. So once all this is over, um, seeing how she gets back into it, because she kind of has to, she left Florida, she left DC to start in Florida. And then she kind of restarted back in DC. Then when all this is over, she kind of has to restart. So she never totally restarted, but she kind of had a, some setbacks. And now she has to kind of go um, and see how she works through those. Right, right. So were you a wrestling fan at all before um, you interviewed Trish? Yeah, I mean, I grew up watching it a lot. Um, uh, I was really into ECW when I was um, in middle school and high school. Okay. Um, And so I I remember watching it was little. um, A friend of my mom's would sometimes uh, buy the pay-per-views because, you know, they're expensive back then. They were like $60. Yeah. Um, So... He would he would buy them, then he would record them on VHS and and then uh, give them to me and let me borrow them so I could watch them when I was like in elementary school. Right, right. And then I would watch it on like WCW and WWF on TV. Uh, then I discovered um, ECW, so I was like really into that, um, just like the characters and just all the crazy stuff they were doing. And then kind of co- when I was in college, I kind of just fell off. I wasn't really watching a lot. Um, I kind of just focused on school and everything. And then I would say maybe like six after college, so maybe like six years ago, I got back into it uh, and kind of discovered stuff like New Japan Pro Wrestling, um, like All Japan. Um, I've been watching a lot of DDT recently. 
um, NXT, of course. Um, so I kind of got back into it. And then um, even before that, I kind of just was watching stuff like, have you seen Beyond the Mat? Um, no, I haven't. No. Yeah. So that's a documentary that came out in 99. Um, and it basically followed Mick Foley. Um, it followed a couple other guys. And it, it was a documentary. And um, it kind of just shone light on, like, what the actual life was like as a wrestler. Um, so I kind of gained, through the years, I kind of gained an appreciation of, like, what they put their bodies through, uh, how they trained, and what it took to be a wrestler. Um, yeah, so I've just been, like, really into it. Um, just watching a lot of, especially just a lot of Japanese promotions recently when I can Right, right. And um, local, going to local shows, I started, like I said, I mentioned Nova Pro. So I went to a few of their shows um, before they folded. Um, and then Primetime Pro Wrestling, it was DC's the kind of like first big promotion, I believe, in a long time, maybe ever. And they started last year. So this was maybe like their, I don't know. They, they've only had a few handful of shows so far. Right, right. So our backgrounds are pretty similar. And for people who are watching, who will watch this on YouTube. So we met over Twitter um, just because we both have projects that have to do with wrestling. So my documentary is called Lady Wrestler, The Amazing Untold Story of African-American Women in the Ring. So yeah, I was yeah. a wrestling fan when I was like in middle school. So I yeah, watched, yeah. Um, you know, WCW and uh, the WWF on TBS on cable. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and I was a big fan of Rowdy Roddy Piper and, you know, some of the old time wrestlers like that. But I actually stopped wrestling when I was, I mean, stopped watching wrestling when I was in high school. I just completely forgot about it. And mm -hmm. so most of my career has been in print journalism. I'm, I'm based in Columbus, Ohio. So yeah, yeah. Um, I was working for this uh, local newspaper and uh, this friend of mine who works in public relations kept telling me that there was this interesting woman that I should interview. And he set up a, uh, an interview with her and it uh, turned out to be this woman named Ethel Johnson who was like one of the first black female professional wrestlers ever she started in the 1950s her sister Babs was actually the first and then Babs recruited Ethel and then Ethel recruited their younger sister Marva so I actually got interested in their story because of the like the history angle like I frankly was I thought it was interesting that they were like black women in wrestling at such a you know a time when there were hardly any like really famous women athletes let alone black black women athletes Mm -hmm. So the history angle is what attracted me to their story. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of interesting that we both kind of had that background. We were interested in wrestling when we were younger and then kind of lost interest a little bit. And then kind of when we started working on the yeah, project, yeah, yeah. kind of reignited interest in it. Yeah. Have you heard of a um, wrestler named Sweet Georgia Brown? Yeah, actually, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the Vice series on like the dark side of wrestling, but they did a whole episode. Well, it wasn't. I think it was a whole episode on uh, Sweet Georgia Brown. It was either okay, an episode I haven't seen on, that episode yet. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember if it was the it was the, if it was an episode on her or if it was the episode on the uh, the fabulous Moolah because I think okay. she was managed by the fabulous Moolah. Okay, because a friend of mine um, who saw so a friend of mine uh, who I told about my project, yeah. she said that she watched that episode. Uh, and I'm, I was just looking Sweet back Georgia at Brown. Them. Yeah, and I was yeah. looking back at the message just now, and she was just saying how now she's just kind of like really obsessed with kind of like finding the history yeah. about black women wrestlers. So then I told yeah. her about your project too, because she was like, she saw that and it was crazy. So I feel like, I don't know, I just kind of feel like there, there's an interest to it. It's kind of just like, you can, people will be interested in it, but for some reason there just hasn't been many people kind of delving into it maybe the people think that no one would care or no one would be interested in it i don't know yeah well i will I to, yeah you know? in the research for my documentary what i found that it was a combination of things number one there was a promoter named billy wolf who was actually based in my city columbus who was like the main um he was like the vince mcmahon of of his time so after wow. he passed away in the 60s women's wrestling kind of faded away for a while until it sort of, until it uh, kind of made a comeback in the eighties. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then a lot of the black women who started out, they had already like retired by the time the eighties rolled around and they weren't really 
a lot of them were like mothers and like they went on to second careers as like, uh, you know, just working totally outside of the wrestling industry. So a lot of them weren't interested in talking about their experiences because they experienced a lot of racism and a lot of sexism. I mean, I, if, if you see this yeah. Georgia Brown episode of Vice News, I mean, they imply that she was being pimped out. Like she was, her, her uh, children say that she'd leave on these wrestling trips and, you know, several months later she'd be pregnant. And so they, they implied that she was being, you know, <laughs> used for anything other than wrestling or that she had to sleep with, you know, certain men to get certain matches and stuff. So there, there really is a dark side of wrestling. And a lot of the women who are pioneers, some of them don't want to talk about it because of all the bad experiences. I'm not, I'm the women that I interviewed, they didn't, they didn't say anything about like, you know, sexual harassment or anything like that, but they, but they did talk a lot about racism and about sexism, not making them as much as the men. And, you know, it was just it was just an all around difficult time for African Americans, let alone a woman in a really unconventional field. So I think that's part of it. And then uh, Ethel Johnson, uh, the main lady I interviewed in the documentary, she was just once she left wrestling, she just decided to be a mom. And even her daughters said that they didn't know their mother was a wrestler until by chance they saw one of her matches on TV. But she didn't even tell her children she was a wrestler. And then another woman I interviewed, Ramona Isbell, she became a born again Christian. And she felt like people in her church would judge her like, oh, you were running around in a skimpy costume and, you know, doing all this stuff in a wrestling room. So a lot of it was the women themselves didn't want to talk about the history. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I actually went to the University of Notre Dame to do a lot of research. And I mean, they have like boxes and boxes and boxes of press clippings that have just been sitting idle for years. Uh, there was this uh, another promoter named Jack Pfeffer who kind of like saved all these press clippings. So the history is there. It just is just going to take people like you and me to kind of uncover it and, and bring it out to the public. Yeah. Wow. That's wow. Well, it wasn't um, um, Abel Zmula like accused of like doing that a lot of like kind of just exploiting. Prostituting. Yeah. 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 Well, ex exploit just exploiting in general, like underpaying her wrestlers and making them like live on her property and kind of like controlling their lives. That's what they said in this vice news wow. um, episode. And, you know, and it was like one of those things where it was like some of the wrestlers she managed were like, Oh, she was, she was great to me. She was like a mom to me. She provided everything I needed. And then other ones were like, you know, she tried to control me. She tried to, um, you know, sexually exploit me, have me sleep with people to make her money and, so it's just one of those things where it's like everybody has a conflicting story, but a lot of the stories are not good at all about her, unfortunately. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. So after I finished the final edit of my documentary in um, 2018, or actually 2017, I realized I had actually never been to a wrestling match in person. So I went to WrestleCon oh. in Orlando, and it just kind of struck me that um, most of the audience was men, because you think, okay, this is a woman's sport. You think women would be the primary audience, but it was men and they were just like, it just really struck me that these men were like rooting on these women because I don't know any other sport. I can't imagine a women's basketball game where the, the most of the audience is men and they're like running up trying to get selfies with the, your, or there's, you know, women's football. I, you know, there have been a few women's football teams over the years, but it's not common by any means. But I can't imagine a stadium full of men rooting on a women's football team and just like fawning over them and wanting to get their autographs. That's what, that's what really amazed me is just like how passionate the, the fans were, especially the, the male fans. I don't know if you found that yourself, but. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, well, I think, well, part of it was that um, I've, I've been to a couple of WWE shows um, and those are usually pretty mixed. You know, you have men, women, you know, have families, a lot of kids, little kids. Um, but I think with the local shows, um, you know, I've, I've only been to local shows within the past three or four years. So I'm sure it's different than what it used to be. Uh, but there's a lot of people kind of focusing on having diverse, like, rosters and talents. Right. So you're getting a lot of, like, women um, – Butch versus Gore, which is the event that I went to where I filmed her match, uh, that specifically was um, 
primarily, if not majority, if not all, the talent were um, queer or, okay. you know, LGBTQ. Um, um, some were non-binary. Um, so there, the, the, the audience was maybe like, I don't know, half men. Okay. And, you know, a lot of women. Um, there are a lot of just people of all kind of um, identities. Um, but I think that's, I think it's just because, well, partly is like the, there's a lot of like really good women athletes mm-hmm. and a lot of things that, uh, and that I think goes back to WCW because they had a lot of like really good athletes, especially from Japan, um, because the women wrestlers from Japan are just on like another level. Yeah. Uh, and I think some of the, some of those trainings have kind of made it over here um, to the U.S. and to the U.K. and everything. Uh, and they're just, I think part of it is that you're, they're just really good. Um, and I think the other part is that it's a, it's a different medium because it's not entirely just a sport. Um, it's, it's also that theater component. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like rooting for a character on like a HBO show or something in a way too. Like a reality show or something. Yeah. It's like that reality show because in hybrid kind of sport thing. And I think you get a different type of uh, uh, like audience member, I think. And they, they kind of have a different connection that you get um, when you're watching something live. Uh, it's just a different connection than someone who's just a purely scripted character. Right. Have yeah. you seen um, Fighting With My Family with The Rock? No, I haven't seen that. The one with, That's the one about Paige, right? Yeah, yeah. Vince Vaughn plays a coach in that. And he has this um, great line where he says, wrestling is storytelling, it's opera and spandex. And I think yeah. that's, that's a great way to describe it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's theater for sure. Um, I, I think personally, I think it's like, it's like the best entertainment like that there is out there. Um, I think it's just so unique. Um, and I, I think, especially recently, like there's, there's so much and there, there's so much out there and that I think there's something for everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why I watched, I don't know if you're familiar with DDT in Japan. No, I'm not. Um, but that's a promotion where they do a lot of comedy and they do a lot of serious um, kind of uh, like matches and everything. But they have everything from, they've literally done matches on a monorail on a moving monorail oh, wow. car. Uh, they've done matches like in a park. They've done matches in a, like a water park. Um, I just watched a match the other day. It was an hour long 10 man tag team match at a campsite. Um, wow. and, they, and they do stuff like that. And it's, it's kind of like anime coming to life. You know, I think when I was younger, I thought it was cool because kind of like, it's a real life comic book. Um, and then even now it's like, I'm not, I'm not in awe by kind of like, you know, you, you kind of, when you learn how the moves are done and everything, um, when you're older, you kind of get like a appreciation, like I said. Um, but there's just now a lot of creativity um, happening. Um, and it's even going, it's going, for me, it's going to be like beyond theater. You know, we were having this match going on in these sites, like, like yeah. a part, like a literal monorail. Uh, and it was like a moving monorail. And then at every stop, wrestlers would come on. And there were actually people, they had an audience sitting in the in the actual chairs on the monorail. So wow. um, so stuff like that. So I think it's even, I think it's even beyond opera. I think it's even beyond theater in a way. Um, yeah, it's like extreme sports. Like Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that. So that's what kind of, and I think that's what I look forward to the most. And I think... That's important to have a good crowd. Um, I mentioned this um, in an interview I did with um, earlier this week. It was just how um, how the connection to the crowd is like one of the most important. Like it's the most important thing. Like at the end of it, um, it's not really about how many moves you can do. It's not about how cool a move you can do. Like how complicated, how many like kicks and flips you can fit in a match. It's like, can you connect with the crowd? Can you either get them on your side or get them to boo you? You know, um, 
can you get people invested emotionally, you know, to the point where, you know, at that match where she won the title, everyone was like stood up and screaming. Um, people were like, like banging on the ring mat, like screaming her name and stuff like that. Um, so I think it's just, it, it, it requires like a level of participation that you don't really get a chance chance to do in opera and theater you know you might especially like an opera like a dance you know it's kind of you sit respective respectfully and you kind of watch it and you either you laugh when there's something funny or you maybe sigh or you you might have a kind of response for something that's emotional but with wrestling it's you part of the the charm and it's hard for me to watch wrestling now with promotions that are doing it without the audience it's just having that audience reaction how do you feel, um, so you said that Indelible focuses on LGBTQ issues. Um, do you feel that wrestling fans are like um, accepting of LGBTQ um, performers or the audience, them, you know, the, the matches that you go to or the audience themselves, a lot of them LGBT, I mean, is it, yeah. is it wrestling sort of like anything goes, like you, it doesn't matter what your sexuality is or what your gender is, you, as long as you can wrestle or what, what's, what's your feeling on that? Well, I think part of it is just because of where I am in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, you know, D.C. is just, like very diverse. Um, you know, there's a lot of just people working on causes. Um, it's very limp, liberal. Yeah. Uh, um, so you get a lot of people just from everywhere. Um, yeah. You get a lot of people who have maybe been scolded for the identity or whatever from their small town. Um somewhere else in the U.S. and they come here and it's like, you know, they can find a community. Yeah. Um, the shows I've been to, like I said, they're, people are just, it's like, like you said, anything goes. Um, mm -hmm. like, like Butch versus Gore, I think they started with the drag performance at the wow. beginning of the show. Wow. Um, I was backstage with Trish, so I didn't see it, but I saw the, I saw the performers getting like their makeup and done before. Um, and they weren't, like the the competitors weren't like comedy uh wrestlers you know they weren't like just kind of like they were they were competing they were actually having um you know they were having like matches um you know they were competitive hard hitting is that they might have been gay or lesbian or bi or trans or whatever or non binary uh -huh. um and the audience there specifically was very into it you know um they kind of, I think with primetime, they kind of, it's it's kind of like one of their things is that, you know, this is kind of what we promote. I, uh, one of the founders uh, themselves um, is non-binary. Um, so they kind of set a, set a precedent that um, they're not going to tolerate anyone like being homophobic or whatever. Um, and I, I think, like you said, everyone just, anything goes, people just want to be entertained. Um, People want to see. People don't want to see the same stuff over and over again. Um, and I think there's an audience and like there's an audience and market for not just having the same um, kind of characters and the same kind of matches. Um, and people would people would support it, and you don't necessarily have to identify with that. You know, like I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a white redneck from texas you know what i'm saying but yeah. i you know when when steve austin came out um it was crazy like a lot of my friends you know like men and women white and non-white were in a steve austin um so i think that's kind of what's happening now is that people um are seeing that you know you can have legit competitors and characters that they can cheer or boo or just um connect to apart from kind of like the straight male archetype right right so antonio i think zoom is going to cut us off pretty soon so <laughs> how can people see indelible and how can people you know if they want to follow you on social media how can they get in touch with you um yeah so you can watch uh indelible at uh, indelible.life um on instagram it's uh, at indelible life and then my my instagram handle is electric llama and so all the episodes are online right now um, including um, Trisha's uh, episode, which is also named um, Southside Suplex because she's from Southeast D.C. Okay, cool. 
Well, thanks for making the time to do this. I look forward to checking Indelible out. So yeah, and I'll keep you updated when um, Lady Wrestler gets released. It's gonna be released uh, later this year, so. Okay, cool. I appreciate you making the time to do this. Yeah, thanks Chris, man. I hope you enjoyed the conversation between Antonio and I. I will put links to both our documentaries in the description to this video. And if you like this video, please like it, share it, and subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.